Living with ADHD can be an extremely challenging experience for people. I've done a lot of work on the anxiety and the depression side of stuff and I got so far with it and like I was a lot less anxious, my mood was generally a bit better and loads of little traits started shining through and we started thinking like, well, why is there certain things that aren't getting better and why, why is that becoming so obvious now? And a couple of the big things people have trouble with with ADHD, it's almost like your, your logic brain and your daydreaming brain are like fighting with each other constantly. Yeah. So many people being diagnosed as adults because the research is starting to catch up and people are getting an awareness of what the symptoms actually are and how it presents. So it's 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 definitely starting to pick up a lot of speed now, but I think it's about 7% of adults are estimated to have it worldwide. So I got Chris onto the podcast who has been diagnosed with ADHD as an adult. So he came on to basically walk us through how getting that diagnosis has allowed him to look back on previous experiences and events in his life through a different lens. Things make a bit more sense to him now. He also came on to talk us through sort of the daily signs of ADHD in people's lives and also what's going on on a neurological level in someone's brain that has ADHD. And he also walked us through, you know, some uh, advice and tips and tricks that he's implemented into his own life to help him manage and live with ADHD. Really nice guy, very insightful episode as always. And if you've got ADHD yourself or you know someone that has ADHD, you're going to get some value from it. So get yourself a bevy, kick back, relax, and absorb everything that's about to be said. Come there, it's very official this. Yeah, mate. Mate, just, honestly, some of the software that I've been using previously, I've been doing like whole episodes and then like, obviously you download it at the end yeah, and it's yeah. just like, the files are just corrupt. Like, I'm like, that was like a fucking amazing episode, man. And we've yeah, lost yeah, all of it. it up. <laughs> yeah, so like this is a, this Iris platform seems to be doing all right at the moment. So Yeah, it seems good, it seems good. Yeah, man, I'm sticking with this for now. But anyway, welcome to the podcast, man. I appreciate you coming Cheers, on. Man. It's good to be here. Yeah, man. Um, as always, I'd like to kick off with you giving me and the listeners just a background on yourself, bro. Give us your story. Um, you know, what's brought you up until this point in your life? Yeah, so my name's Chris. Um, I suppose this point in my life, um, the whole social media side of things, I started something called Happiness in Movement like a year after I finished uni, so it'll be about like four years ago now. I was really struggling with my mental health when I first started working. So I graduated as a physio and working in healthcare, it can be pretty hectic. And uh, it did happiness in movement as a way of like talking about those experiences. Um, and obviously some of the stuff we'll get onto has been a uh, recent development, but yeah, yeah it's, it's been good. It's been a, a big learning curve. It's really helped me learn how to support myself. And it's uh, it's been good meeting people like yourself that are doing the same thing. So uh, yeah, it's been a, a really positive thing really. And uh, on, to, on to the next, I suppose. Yeah, for sure, man, for sure. So tell me more about what was going on with your mental health when you came out of uni then and your first Yeah, started. so <laughs> it, it kind of kicked off at uni to start off with, to be fair. I was in quite a tough relationship going into my second year of uni and healthcare courses can be mad intense like the physio one there's a lot of like skill acquisition there's a lot of knowledge that you have to gain especially when you're going to your second year and on top of that like you're doing placements you're working there's all the assignments and it yeah. just it just got too much man so started really struggling with um what I thought was like anxiety depression and like it it, it definitely was but like obviously, uh, you know yourself, I recently got diagnosed with ADHD and it turns out things like anxiety and depression, they're basically like an outcome of undiagnosed ADHD because your body's just so out of sync with everything and your nervous system's just right. so heightened. And okay, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't realise that until recently, obviously, but go, going into work in life, it was just like a another step up because obviously you've got way more responsibility as a physio once you actually start. And yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty hectic for a time. Yeah, man. Okay. So tell me more about like, I mean, obviously it sounds like you spent four years struggling with this undiagnosed ADHD. Like, yeah. To be fair, most of my life, like you, you look back at your life after you get diagnosed and you start sort of piecing everything together, connecting dots and you're like, oh, so that's what that was. Yeah, so like, there were loads of things that I'd have struggled with my whole life and because you don't know you've got ADHD, you've just got people telling you like, you're, you're too sensitive and you, you're just being lazy, you need to try harder. And there's just so much like blame and shame that gets put on you. And you, you really internalize a lot of it. So 
I was like a, a high achieving people pleasing perfectionist and as you'll know yourself you can't please everyone and when you're constantly trying to it just ends up burning you out and especially working in healthcare you take on a lot of other people's problems and uh when, when you're internalizing that much it just just got way way too heavy man but yeah now, now that i've had the diagnosis and i'm starting to sort of understand that a bit more and piece it all together i'm definitely starting to uh find my way start to accept myself a lot more so it's been a it's been a really positive thing since i found that out this year yeah for sure man for sure so what what caused you to go and get diagnosed for adhd like what what caused you to go and get that test yeah so it was actually my partner that sort of put me onto the idea to start off with and it was probably about 18 months ago now to be fair because i've done a lot of work on the anxiety and the depression side of stuff and I got so far with it and like I was a lot less anxious my mood was generally a bit better and loads of little traits started shining through and we started thinking like well why is there certain things that aren't getting better and why, why is that becoming so obvious now and she suggested sort of looking into it a bit and I started sort of just watching videos online listening to a few podcasts and I was like this just fits the bill so much so I, I took a few online tests and I was getting like moderate to severe on every single one so i went and spoke to my gp and i got referred on the nhs to start off with but they've got like mad waiting list it's like seven yeah. years in some places oh, so seven years. i know it's ridiculous so I, I think i was on the waiting list for like about 18 months um and then i ended up i ended up paying and going private actually in the end and got my diagnosis and i started meds recently and uh yeah, that's that's kind of where we are at the minute, really. That's what led me on to doing the TikTok stuff because there's there's a massive community of ADHD people on TikTok because it's like a dopamine machine. And it's just yeah, yeah, easy easy to maintain your attention. So yeah. I've come across a, a lot of people on there that I'm learning from, and it's a proper supportive place as well. So that's, that's been really good too. Yeah, nice man, nice. And what what sort of meds are you on at the moment then? And what's what's been it's, the difference? It, it's called Elvance. So a couple of the big things people have trouble with with ADHD it's almost like your your logic brain and your daydreaming brain are like fighting with each other constantly yeah. so like yeah. a, a neurotypical brain you can kind of flick between them as you need to and in ADHD you're constantly about to daydream constantly thinking about something else and it's really hard to just focus on one thing so the, the meds essentially help you to sort of have that bit more direction um, and I'm, I'm still early doors with it to be fair like the, the recommended dose is like 50 to 70 milligrams and i'm only up to 40 at the minute so you, you start quite low and then build it up um but even just over just a few weeks of it like i'm I'm way less anxious i feel way less fatigued by the end of the day and like i'm just able to pick what i need to do a little bit more effectively instead of having it sort of like battle with yourself to make a decision so yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah, been, yeah. been pretty good so far but once i'm up to like the actual dose people say that it gets gets really really useful so i'll uh, see how it goes in the coming weeks i guess yeah sick man sick is there any like um potential side effects of that medication or yeah so yeah so to start off with especially once you get used to and most people say that with elvance anyway from what i've come across they say that most of the side effects go away so to start off with it was like really bad dry mouth i was getting like really bad stomach cramps at one point as well they're like a, a common side effect in men you do get a pretty reduced appetite so like i do have to remind myself to eat a lot through the day and i'm not eating as much but still still getting some meals in so it's, it's not yeah, too bad but yeah. people say once you've been steady on the right dose for a while all that stuff tends to go away and then you don't really realize you're on medication anymore which it's kind of mad to be fair because like you, you do notice a lot of the effects now but it's it's quite a it's quite a subtle change like yeah. you'd be expecting like this this sort of moment of clarity but you, you just catch yourself doing something you're like I've not been distracted for ages or like I'm concentrating on that well easy compared to normal. So it's, it's kind of funny. You just catch yourself every now and again and it's just like, oh, that, that must be the meds. Yeah, okay, so, okay. Yeah, it's good. This, this is what it's like to kind of live with a bit of normality, I guess. Versus yeah, yeah, exactly. Everyone brain. says like, oh, that's that's what like a neurotypical brain is like. And it's, it's kind of interesting to be fair, realising that like other people haven't had all that stuff going on the whole time. So yeah, that, that, that's been quite good for the whole self-acceptance thing. Like, when you realize that other people haven't had all those problems and you realize just how difficult it's actually been because of it so yeah it's quite a, quite affirming really to realize that like you've you've done quite well despite all that and then there's a there's a lot of potential moving forward now which is good so yeah yeah sick man sick tell me more about the self-acceptance because you mentioned like you know you used to be quite like a, a people pleaser sort of taking mm. on other people's shit for them 
Yeah, um, yeah. So I don't know if it's like purely an environmental thing, but I, I guess it is going to be a bit of a combination of like the undiagnosed ADHD, my environment. As a kid, you kind of end up feeling like you're a little bit too much, like people can't handle your emotions and they see you as being a little bit needy, a bit over the top. And obviously as a kid growing up, you just internalize all that and you blame yourself for it. So that leads to you sort of taking care of other people first because that's that's where you seem to get your value from like if i'm making other people feel good if i'm looking after them then yeah i'm not causing problems that way so that's where i get my value from um and you don't you don't really put your own needs first and you'll you'll know yourself from the mental health stuff if you're not actually prioritizing your health it does just decline and that was that was definitely the case for me the older i got and it reached crisis point at uni really so since since having the diagnosis especially but even in the build-up to waiting to get the diagnosis because i was like it seems pretty obvious that this is what i've got you start sort of just accepting the way that you work and then doing things that would help that so even before i was diagnosed i started like implementing strategies that people with adhd spoke about in terms of like time management and daily routines and how to make that stuff a bit easier and I don't know, you, I just stopped judging myself and needing to do things a different way. And since stopping judging myself and just doing what I felt I needed to do, everything's just seeming to fall into place and become a lot smoother. Like I'm I'm still early doors and there's still stuff I'm struggling with. But yeah, I, I just think you, you get this idea of yourself where it's like, all right, it's not that I've not been doing enough of this and it's not that I'm too much of that. There's There's, a, there's an actual brain type that I've been dealing with and when, when you start to accept it in that way it makes it way easier to start looking after yourself and actually properly prioritizing your health so it's been a it's been a learning curve you know it sounds, yeah, sounds big but it's been a very gradual thing over the past few years but I'm, I'm getting there nah for sure man for sure and I think I think that when it comes down to like any mental health condition you know that self-acceptance and kind of just saying like okay I'm not going to put all the blame on myself and feel guilty for experiencing this. It's just part of mm. who I am. I think it's a very powerful way of framing things because I think, again, talking from personal experience, like when I first went through it with like anxiety quite a few years ago, it was just ridden, yeah. with, ridden with guilt, man. I was like, this, yeah. isn't, this isn't normal to feel this way. Mm. And, and I feel like if I'd had that mentality of like, well, you know, humans, we're not perfect creatures. We've all got our own individual brains and this is how our individual brains operate. That's and there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably would have been a lot kinder to myself through the process. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And you, you you hit the nail on the head there, really. Like ADHD or not, everyone has got a bit of a different brain. We're all individual, and we are humans at the end of the day. You know, we're we're a, we're a mammal, and there's the certain needs that we need to fulfil. And I think modern life does make us neglect a lot of that stuff. Like we we prioritise work, we prioritise social life. There's, there's so much stuff we give a lot of this time and energy to that doesn't really help fulfill us or recharge us in the right ways and it's it's a learning curve that anyone goes through but mo most people that have been through those types of things like you and i have they do go through a similar process of learning about themselves in that way and starting to care for themselves a bit more and then when, when you start doing that it does extend outwards like me doing the tiktok you doing your podcast and that like you, you end up wanting to spread that elsewhere and it just ends up better in everybody else as well because you just support each other in those things and we need to make sure like as a society we're planning around those things and looking after those things and making it much more of an awareness because it is it is a really common thing uh like everyone can feel anxious everyone's got the capacity to be depressed at some point in their life and yeah like you said people need to know it's okay that that happens sometimes it's not not a it's not a reflection on them yeah man yeah 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 exactly exactly and j just on the back of that do you think that there are like I wouldn't, I don't know about millions of, a lot of people knocking around who are maybe undiagnosed with ADHD that are currently yeah. suffering at the moment. 100%. So something I've come across a lot on TikTok is that people are saying like, oh, I've, everyone's got ADHD nowadays. Like it's well easy to get a diagnosis, like with a waiting list, obviously we know it's not, but the reason people are saying that is because I, th I think at the moment, the rate of adult diagnosis is like four times that of child's diagnosis because it's been massively underdiagnosed for decades now. So like it, it started becoming a bit more of a popular term in like the seventies, I think, but most of the research has been done on lads 
because they tend to be more obvious with it when they're younger. So they have more of like the hyperactive, impulsive uh, symptoms. So it's, it's a bit more obvious, like they used to call it like naughty, naughty boy syndrome. So because yeah. of that, loads of girls got missed because they tend to be a bit more inattentive, a bit more daydreamy, a bit more perfectionist. So it's it's much more subtle. Oh. Um, lads, lads do that as well. Like I, I got missed because I wasn't like a typical hyperactive one. Um, but now there's so many people being diagnosed as adults because the research is starting to catch up and people are getting an awareness of what the symptoms actually are and how it presents so it's 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 definitely starting to pick up a lot of speed now but i think it's about seven percent of adults are estimated to have it worldwide so it's a lot more common than you'd actually think yeah um, Jeez. I, I didn't know anyone that had it until i started the uh started the TikTok, and then obviously you come across that many people and Still don't know anyone personally, but it's it's kind of mad the amount of people that got missed. Like most people I've come across, they only found out like twenties into their thirties, and e even some older than that. But I think it's needed. And um, like sure. that, that many people that got missed, they've obviously been dealing with the outcome of having it undiagnosed, which is your, your typical like anxiety, depression, stress, because your body's just like in chronic overwhelm. So getting that awareness now even for the older generation that are starting to get diagnosed they're, they're sort of going through those same lessons and stopping internalizing it and that way they stop sort of passing those negative lessons onto their kids as well so yeah hopefully we can avoid avoid the next bunch having to go through the same stuff yeah for sure for sure so tell me just on the back of that mate what are some of the sort of telltale signs you think of, of so the, there's sort of three facets of it so you, you've got hyperactivity impulsivity and inattention so the, the hyperactivity as a kid that tends to be a little bit more external so can't sit still constantly playing running around really hard to sort of tie down to a task your impulsivity sort of blurting things out interrupting people uh, not being able to wait your turn for things these are some of the more like obvious signs in kids then the inattention like really distractible distracting others so the reason they call it attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is because they're sort of the most annoying symptoms in childhood so like the stuff that causes the most disruption at school but it's it's not a very accurate term to be fair we'll, we'll go through that in a minute but it's, it's pretty poorly named yeah, okay, okay, <laughs> and okay. uh yeah you, you can have different combinations of that so some some people are more hyperactive impulsive which is the first type some people are mainly inattentive and then you've got combined which is like a mixture of both of them so there's a, there's a massive variation in how it presents and how it affects people it's like the the diagnostic criteria kind of covers hyperactive impulsive inattentive and then there's questions that are a bit more mixed and you basically score like a certain amount out of each of those and if, yeah, if you've okay. got more than a certain amount of each of those symptoms then that's that's the diagnosis but it's a, it's a really in-depth assessment to be fair mine took like three hours so they, they they go through loads of stuff from being a kid to actually diagnose you with it so yeah it's a it's a very very complex thing they, they simplify it a lot with the way they explain it but there's there's so much to it and i'm I, even i'm only just learning about a lot of it to be fair yeah 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 what what sort of stuff were they asking you in the assessment was it like it's like a questionnaire thing like what's kind of so th there's this thing called the dsm5 which is like um like a neurodivergence questionnaire uh, you, you fill a lot of those out before you actually do your assessment and that's what leads to you being referred um, <clears throat> but they, they kind of go back to early life so they talk about like your early years at home and what sort of things affected you and how you behaved with people and then they, they track how things progressed into school life high school working life and it's basically monitoring what symptoms did you have as a kid and then what's carried through to adulthood because yeah symptoms like hyperactivity and inattention like we've got an immature brain when we're a kid so those things are pretty common anyway but it's a case of how bad was it and how much is it carried through because most people grow out of that stuff and that's obviously when your your brain matures so they kind of monitor which things have actually carried through and what sort of impact it's having on you as an adult um and that, that that's where a lot of it starts to ring true really because when you're out in the world as an adult you've got to take care of like jobs and bills and there's loads of responsibilities yeah adhd symptoms really impact on how well you can carry out a lot of normal day-to-day -day tasks and living really so it's it's really in depth it was only meant to be like an hour and a half but the psychiatrist i spoke to said that it always takes longer to actually get a full history of it yeah wow okay okay and and just looping back there mate 
what are some of like the telltale signs in daily life? Like you say, you said like managing bills, like jobs, all this mm. sort of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. So because of some of the inattentive symptoms, like I've had a lot of issue with finances where you've you've forgotten a bill that was due, you've forgotten about a subscription that you've meant to cancel and uh, lo- loads of things like that. Some of the impulsivity side of things, you end up sort of impulsively spending more than you actually have allocated, things like that. So you you, you essentially have like reduced impulse control and you tend to be a lot more forgetful as well. And again, it's different from people to people, but that there, there are a couple of things that can start to impact like your, your financial um, situation. Work-wise for me, working as a physio, it's pretty busy. It's all go. There's a, there's a lot of to and fro between different tasks and having to sort of switch to different things throughout the day. So for me, I really struggled with the pace of the work. Um, so like if someone's talking to me, I can't write notes at the same time, which is a physio when you've got to be taking a history and stuff and you've only got a, a quick amount of time to be doing that in. Like I'd always be running behind with my assessments. I'd be finishing late and I've stay to do my notes afterwards. So that there are a couple of ways that made it more obvious that there were things I was struggling with, but it, it, it always got put down to anxiety because that was like the overriding feeling. Yeah, um, okay, okay, okay. But when, when that stuff improved, we then noticed that like a lot of my inattentive stuff didn't get better and like my, my issues with being able to divert my attention didn't really get any better and stuff like that. So yeah, it's a, uh, as I say, it is, it is early doors for me even learning about it, but I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot. So it's, it's good to get a better understanding of yourself and, uh, there's loads of resources about it to be fair like there's loads of different podcasts talking about it and there's the magazines that are dedicated just to that and there's there's so much research that's been done on it i didn't realize but like it's it's the most heavily researched like neurodivergent brain so oh wow there's there's so much that's been looked into it over the years that sort of backs up how they manage it and it's 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 cool learning about it to be fair and sort of similar to just general mental health stuff realizing that you're not you're not the first and you're definitely not going to be the last it's uh, it's nice to know that there's definitely a way through it so yeah man. keeps it a bit easier when you're having a bad day with it for sure man for sure and like you know i always say the term sort of like finding peace in each other's suffering um mm. it's, it's a bit of a mad term to use but like the premise behind it is obviously like you say you've now found swarms of people that are in the same boat as you mm. and it's like you know there's two ways of looking at that mate you can either look at it through the lens of like Fuck, you know, look how many people have been diagnosed with this, uh, blah, 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 blah. Or you could be like, well, we're all in the same boat here. You know, mm. we're all trying to figure out together. Let's just give it a crack and, you know. Yeah, we'll yeah that's right. So it's a pro- proper good community. Like, everyone's so supportive there because they just get how difficult it is. And growing up always feeling like you're too much, you don't really feel like you can confide in people about that stuff, especially when you think that everybody's like that that's that's been a big thing for me is realizing that like other people don't deal with this like other people don't have it quite as hard as this in a lot of ways like like, life's difficult for everyone in in their own way but realizing that like your brain has been making things 10 times more difficult than it needed to be it's it's nice having people that you can talk to that actually understand it because they've been there so yeah Yeah, it's, it's, it's been really good finding that support system with it yeah that's powerful man that's powerful and um so something I wanted to ask you was like, obviously, I, I saw some TikTok the other day and it was like, oh, signs that you might have ADHD. Mm. And and I think this woman said something along the lines of like, you know, you can go from being the loudest person in the room to um, the idea of any social interaction is just hell. Like this yeah. the, the, the thing. And, mm. like, and she was reading off these other symptoms and I thought, I thought fair enough, this could be, you know, a telltale sign of having ADHD. But I also... Yeah you know, that could just be who you are as a person. And I think, mm. like, do you think that maybe in some way with this this whole sort of, um, so many people getting diagnosed now, do you think there's a lot of people that are just going, well, I've got ADHD? And, and Yeah, and I, I actually posted about that today. Like, I, I, th- I think there's, there's a lot of misinformation about it and it's tough to know exactly what's right, what's not. And when it, when it comes to things that we see online, I think it's so important that you, you do take it with a handful of salt, not even just a pinch, because like a lot of it is people's opinions and their experience. And as I said, like it's so different from person to person. You might yeah. see one person's presentation of ADHD and then people relate to a few of their symptoms and start assuming that they're the same. 
but it's it's so complex and there's such a, a deeper sort of reality to it that anything you see online there there is a chance that you may relate to some of it because a lot of the behaviors and symptoms of people with ADHD people without ADHD can exhibit from time to time so yeah anyone can be forgetful anyone can feel scatterbrained anyone can feel like they can't concentrate and there's loads of reasons for it but the difference with it being ADHD is that it's generally way more frequent and way more severe so a lot of the stuff that we go through people say things like oh I think everybody's a bit ADHD and it's like they're not because it's not a consistent issue for them so like if people have got way too much going on and they're getting stressed it's, it's going to present in some ways where they seem overwhelmed and they're not sleeping well and it's causing issues with like their attention but the the thing with ADHD is you can be doing everything right and that's still going on so you can be looking after everything in the right way and you can still just be completely overwhelmed and not keeping up so it's it's important to make sure you're actually looking up a bit more a bit more research on it and doing some proper digging I think people do tend to uh almost jump on the bandwagon a little bit when they see stuff online because they relate to yeah. it. And I think people can be desperate for that sense of community and desperate to have people that relate to them. So yeah. when they see those traits, they can think like, oh yeah, that, that, that must be it then. That explains it because people, people kind of want to know what's going on with them so they can make sense of it. And if it does turn out to be that, then great. But yeah, we, we, we do tread a little bit too close to having people sort of diagnosing mental health issues like even things like anxiety disorders you know everyone can feel anxious but it doesn't make it a disorder like mate, you might have bad true. eyesight but it doesn't make you completely blind it's, it's so a true, similar man. thing like there's there's levels to it you know so true so true and i think i think like the the issue is naturally as humans like you say if we if like we always want to attach a label to something like we don't mm. want to we don't want to just be told oh well, it's a little bit of this a little bit of that you know we, we're not mm. sure we want to be able to say this is anxiety this is what's wrong with me and yeah. now I know that what I need to do to overcome it. Um, yeah. So I feel like that is why people sort of like cling on to like, you mm. know, like you say, oh, well, I resonated with one out of the eight symptoms of ADHD there. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. it. Right. Really? Almost let's good. go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, man, it's, it's, it's a sticky one. But um, I feel like the online world in general, man, like you've, you've got to be careful with, pretty much all the content you consume definitely because you know I, I was saying to you at the start of the call like I've kind of you know had to find the sweet spot with what I'm talking about because I'm no therapist man and mm. you know even though I'm taking information that you know qualified people are coming on the podcast and giving me yeah, and yeah. regurgitating it's still really not my position to be telling people if you do x y and z your mental health will be impacted in X, Y, and Z. It's just not, Definitely. You know, I'm not qualified to do that, man. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally get that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's good to want to spread messages and help, but I think, especially when we're doing sort of content creation, it's just really important that we make it quite clear that it is personal experience and these things that have helped us. And like, if you relate, then great, but it's it's definitely not a place to find all the answers. I think there's there's a lot of good that comes from social media and that side of things, but... It, it can go too far, definitely. So it's it's, yeah. it's it's good to find people that are sort of honest about the limitations of what they say. So like a lot of stuff that I talk about, I make it quite clear that it's just, just my experience, my opinion, and try to encourage people to do a bit of research as well because I, I, I had to do that. Like I didn't just see a few bits online and think, oh, yeah, I'm just going to speak to my GP about ADHD. Like you, you, you need to do a lot of reading as well to actually get a bit of a backing for what you're talking about and... You know, like 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 with the ADHD stuff, there's all the online tests. So there's 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 ways around it where you do need to get a bit more of a a formal thing to take to people. And I think it's important people are made aware that that's the case as well, because it is it is too easy for people to jump on, and you you don't want people sort of setting themselves off down a path and thinking that that's the answer, and then finding out that there's something else that they actually need to be taking care of. And yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's different for everyone, but it's such a such a complex area, really, isn't it? It is, man. It is. It is. And what's what's social media like for someone with with high ADHD, such as yourself? Like, I can imagine, like mm. the the addictive nature 
yeah. of, of opening those apps. I mean, it, like, yeah, it, like, definitely. It's, it's bad enough for everyone else, mate. You know, like everyone's attention is just fucked as a result of these apps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can't. Yeah, def- definitely something that can uh, drag you in. So the um, ADHD people call it doom scrolling, where your brain kind of latches onto it, and then before you know it, you've been sat there for hours just watching videos and listening to shit, and you don't even realize because your brain's getting that steady source of quick easy dopamine and it's just so easy to stick onto it like that so yeah it's a it's a a big one to make sure you're sort of limiting your screen time because that can have a a negative knock-on effect on a lot of the symptoms as well if you're getting like too much blue light not doing enough natural stuff through the day and same for anyone's brain but especially for someone that's sort of got a bit of a dopamine regulation issue so it's definitely one that you've got to monitor yourself on but uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, 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 there's other symptoms with it as well so it's it's not necessarily a symptom it's more like a collection of behaviors but there's there's something called rejection sensitivity dysphoria so the adhd brain tends to have a really heightened emotional response and sort of physical response to real or perceived rejection and obviously online it's very easy to feel rejected if you're not sort of being received. So if you put a video out and it don't get much attention, you you quickly start thinking people are sitting there looking at your videos and saying like, oh, this, this guy's a knobhead and uh, that, that content's not worth it. And you, you end up really internalizing that. So that's caused a lot of trouble with me in friendships growing up, but it's, it's definitely one thing on social media that I've had to get a, a real grip on. And since learning that was part of ADHD, again, it's it's helped to sort of separate yourself from the symptoms a little bit and realise why you're doing it and makes it makes it a lot easier to manage that one. But to be fair, I, I didn't really realise I'd started working on that thinking it was anxiety beforehand. So I'd, I'd kind of got a grip on a lot of the emotional side of stuff before I even got diagnosed. So the, the meds were more so to help with the brain side of it. But from like a behavioural perspective, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of got a lot of it to grips anyway. So... Yeah, man. But yeah, there's, there's just so many layers to it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, walk me through some of the sort of methods you were using for what you thought was just anxiety. Like, we're using like yeah. meditation. Like, what? What? Yeah, yeah. My mindfulness was a huge one for me. To be fair, so I, I came onto mindfulness when I first started having trouble at work. Um, so that'd be like just just under a year, I think, of working in the NHS. I was working on respiratory wards, so. A lot of very unwell people really busy i was working on like a pediatric unit where they were really unwell and you did a lot of work on intensive care too so that was that was heavy and i got turned on to mindfulness by a counselor that i saw through work for a little while and the thing with mindfulness obviously it gets you really in tune and aware of things that you're thinking about and you're sort of bodily response to when you're thinking about those things so you may have come across this yourself but there's there's a mindfulness exercise where you, you sit and intentionally think about like really positive outcomes for things and you think about where your life's heading if everything goes right and you then take notice of how that's making you feel within your body like where can you feel those emotions and then you flip it and think about all the problems in your life and where things are headed as they are right now and then you, you see where those negative emotions come up doing exercises like that it gets you that awareness of like your emotional response to things and then you can learn to sort of self-regulate that a little bit better so ADHD has have a big problem with emotional dysregulation so we have really heightened emotional responses to things compared to other people and we can go through a, a much bigger range of emotions on a daily basis they can switch a lot quicker and it means that they kind of hang around a lot longer so mindfulness for me has been really effective in getting an awareness of those responses and the, the sort of time frame that they're there for and learning triggers for those emotions and that all came about pre-ADHD so that that, that was something that I've been working on for a, like at least a few years before I even got diagnosed so I felt like I had a pretty pretty good grip on that before it even came around so it's it's been useful because you go through a proper emotional roller coaster after you get diagnosed when you start like looking back at your life and reassessing stuff. So it's, it's yeah. been helpful for kind of carrying me through that because you, you do grieve a little bit, thinking about like what life could have been like if you'd known and stuff like yeah, that. And fuck. Kind of get angry at people that didn't notice. So you, you've got to kind of learn to ride that wave after you find out. And I feel like it's smoothened that process. I, I speak to a lot of people where they struggled for a long time after they got diagnosed, sort of coming to terms with it. And I, I feel like having all that awareness before I even got diagnosed, it's really helped me to... So I'll carry myself through that process a bit better. Yeah, 
Nice, man. Nice. Anything else in conjunction with mindfulness? Sort of like, um, you know, I don't know, some people use like cold showers for anxiety, for example. Oh, um, I do that as well. Yeah, I love cold showers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mate, um, yeah, yeah. I started doing that. Um, to be fair, I started doing that more so for sort of like looking after my skin and my scalp and stuff like that because one one other thing that you get as well i'm going off a lot of tangents here this isn't about right. <laughs> so like adhd as we uh we get really like sensory overloaded so you'd always have like itchy skin picking at your scalp stuff like that so I, I started cold showers for that but then i realized how good it was for my brain and like my uh, my mood and my anxiety so I've, that, that, that's another thing that i do now and i think again it kind of gets you in tune with self-soothing and regulating so that's that's an, another big thing that i've been using for probably a good couple of years at this point, to be fair, just to help with the anxiety. So I, I can't remember last time I had a hot shower, to be fair, just because I find the cold ones are just so much more natural. Oh, shit. So you're not even having a hot shower first and doing cold no, at the end. No, you're I just, just dive in straight with a cold, get a bit of breathing going, calm myself down. It's it's ace. <laughs> even, for, even through the winter, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> so saving on bills as well as a crisis. Mate, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I bet you're, I bet you're saving wedge, right? But... Um, <laughs> God, man, you got balls of steel, mate. There's absolutely no like, <laughs> like I like I'm I'm all for cold showers, but relatively normal, yeah, like relatively normal temperature, a couple of minutes, clean myself, whatever. Then I'm like, all right, we'll gradually ease it down. Hey, you're a madman getting straight in with the cold. <laughs> uh, there's, there's actually a lot of science behind it. To be fair, so like the uh, the shock of the cold water, it kind of triggers your nervous system into producing more dopamine and norepinephrine, which is the the main thing that we have trouble regulating. Um, so it, it really boosts the level of those because it gives you that shock factor and your body kind of goes into survival mode for a minute. And that, that's kind of why it helps people so much being more focused and calm afterwards because you've, you've got a lot more of that chemical available. So Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I only found that out recently. Like I, I was loving them before that, but that's kind of spurred me on to definitely keeping it routine. Yeah, for sure, man, for sure. I, I had a bloke on before, um, TJ Powers, a neuroscientist, and he, yeah. he wrote down kind of like, th this sounded mad to me, but like, it's like, Alcohol increases dopamine by two and a half times. Mm. And I think it's like nine, a nine minute or a 12 minute window. And then you start crashing and then you're like, right, more, more, Another more drink. And that, you know, that's why you, you know, you start your head doing shots at the bar at midnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, he said that cold showers do the same thing two and a half times, but like it comes up and it very gradually sort of like, you know, you don't get that Cops. crash like, like yeah, you do with yeah. alcohol, um, which is fascinating to be fair, mate. It's all the more yeah, reason why everyone should be getting on the cold showers yeah literally like hot, hot showers feel good but cold showers are good yeah man that's a good way of wording it just on, just on the back of that with like alcohol is there any kind of like with adhd is yeah. like an alcohol like affects it in any way like does it bring yeah out definitely more, i mean like... it, it 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 kind of affects your brain in the same way like the, the adhd brain it, it still gets those same responses from things but because we have trouble regulating dopamine, we, we've kind of got less dopamine receptors in uh, certain areas in the brain. So when we find things that give us a steady source of dopamine, we tend to be a little bit more obsessive and addictive with it. So people do tend to get like more addictive behaviors like alcohol, smoking, substance use, oh, right, okay. phone use, things like that. I think things that give you a really easy, steady source of dopamine. Um, a lot of people end up with like binge eating behaviors there's there's loads of overlap with like other things like that just because it it kind of gives your brain what it needs but it's it's often easier unhealthier ways of getting it and that's that's where people tend to fall into a a bit of a trap a lot of people struggle with addiction and stuff like that until they end up sort of getting diagnosed and getting the right kind of treatment so yeah yeah it's, uh, it's definitely not all shits and giggles anyway there's um, a lot of, lot, of, lot of negative sides to it a lot of the stuff we talk about is quite quite quirky and light-hearted but it's 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 tough to deal with man and people of any walk of life they can end up struggling with the same kind of things but we're, we're definitely a little bit more prone to those types of uh behaviors trying to trying to give us brain the dopamine that he's wanting so yeah, yeah absolutely man and it, it's funny you should say that mate like how you know the content i've been exposed to online around adhd and stuff it does mm -hmm. get presented as this like quirky little like almost like yeah art, you know you have the ability to I don't even know, but like it always, it's always presented as like, like you say, this quirky. Oh, you know, this is what happens if you have ADHD. But the reality yeah. is, it, it can be a very sort of dark time for people, man. 
it's very damaging man especially when you're undiagnosed like being diagnosed and having the right help it's still difficult but mm. for the majority that don't get diagnosed it, it can be hell man because like we were talking about at the start you end up really shaming yourself for a lot of stuff and kids with adhd get criticized so much more than the peers and that has such a negative impact on your self-esteem and we're like other humans in the sense that we'll we'll try to cope with that however we can and yeah. modern life there's there's a lot of easy unhealthy ways of coping with stuff like that and when it when it isn't treated well or it's not managed well like me struggling with things like anxiety and depression like i were down a really dark path with that and like luckily i managed to find people that were supporting me through it but if i hadn't had that support system like i, I, I wouldn't even be sitting here talking to you and yeah for sure man for sure it's it is, it is done in a light-hearted way because I think people want to show how relatable they are and they want people to know that there's there's people out there that are like them. But I I try to talk about the darker side of it not as often as possible, but I make sure I include that stuff because it is, it is easy for people to see it as, like you said, a quirk, quirky little thing where there's these like funny little traits and, oh, I'm, I'm so ditzy and forgetful and it's like, it can have such a massive impact on your life and your relationships and how you function. And it's, it's important that people know it's a really, really fucking serious thing to be dealing with. And yeah. it's, it's definitely not something to be taken lightly. And we, we, with people sort of diagnosing themselves online, just from seeing those videos, like that, that's, that's where we need to tread really carefully. Cause it's, it's, it's a big thing, you know, it doesn't need to be taken really seriously, even if we do, use humor as a bit of a coping mechanism for some of it people people need to be aware yeah man i agree i feel i think i think it's a problem with kind of mental health conditions full start man like i mean look i'm i'm even guilty of like in the past saying like passing comments like i'll be like oh i gotta do this like i'm, I'm so ocd mm. and it's like I, like i'm not ocd and it's a very yeah. serious mental health condition but like yeah 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 met like i've heard many other people say that in passing comments as well yeah um just because you like to, I don't even know, keep a tidy room. <laughs> like it's yeah, gone, it's gone to that point where people be like, oh, well, bloody OCD, man. It's all well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People with OCD have like crippling issues, man. Like it's not, it's not something to be thrown around lightly. It's just one example. Know. Yeah, definitely. That, that, that sits like under that neurodivergent umbrella. It's, mm. it's kind of, uh, there's, there's a lot of overlap with things like ADHD, autism, OCD, Asperger's. Like they, these things really, really overlap and, we do talk about it a bit flippantly like pe people are having a bit of a rough day at work and they're tired and um, I'm, I'm depressed and it's like you can't be saying that man yeah. like that's a, it's a fucking serious thing like yeah. it's a common thing but we, we do take it a little bit too lightly sometimes and pe people use those words a little bit too often i think a bit more uh emotional intelligence to describe how we're feeling needed yeah absolutely absolutely so breakdown for me um you've kind of touched on it a bit throughout the the episode so far man but like on a like neurological level like mm. what's what's going on with someone that's got adhd versus like mm. someone with my brain like what's yeah. what, what's what's the key difference so it's a neurodevelopmental disorder so it's a, it's a brain type so around the age of sort of four your brain is going through key stages of growth and the adhd brain it's 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 mainly a genetic thing there is there is some environmental factors but like probably 75 percent of it is down to genetics um during key stages of your brain development you kind of don't get enough oxygen to certain bits of the brain it's not as effective at using blood sugar and because of this it doesn't go through the same stages of development it does catch up as we get older like i said before but because of that, it means that you've you've generally got less dopamine and norepinephrine receptors in your brain, and um, and they're the two main neurotransmitters that are involved with things like attention and focus and pleasure. Uh, your, your dopamine is something that you actually get at the thought of a task, so you, you get a dopamine yeah. delivery, and that sort of triggers your reward system to then go do the task because you know it'll be fulfilling. ADHD has end up struggling with something called executive dysfunction where those processes don't occur. So you don't get that dopamine delivery ahead of doing a task. And that means that your yeah. body just won't kick into gear to go do the thing you need to do. And it okay. often gets put down to laziness. So 
people might be looking at you sitting and scrolling on your phone and you're there inside your head like screaming at yourself saying I need to get up and go wash up like I've got things to do and you, you, you're forcing yourself to go do it and it's like your body just doesn't kick into gear wow, and it's, okay. it's such an internal battle and um, and that's that's kind of the thing I'm starting to notice with the meds now is like you think about something you need to do and you just get up and go do it and it's like that's what a neurotypical brain is like like they see a task that needs doing and they say i'm gonna go do that and they just go do it there's there's not this internal fight and deliberation about what needs doing and you're kind of constantly problem solving and thinking about steps and solutions and that kind of thing so you, you, your brain is constantly in various places at once and creating connections and there's a lot of pattern recognition so it's it's just constantly sort of looking for things around you and analyzing them and piecing things together you've, you've just got sort of like a constant stream of various thoughts going on yeah. um and that, that's why it often gets put down as anxiety because you start talking about like racing thoughts and not being able to relax and the first thing that's more common is oh you're, you're obviously a bit anxious because you're stressed about work yeah but yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. very different because like i can be completely chill nothing going on i've taken care of stuff and that's still happening and you still have to like really fight with yourself to get stuff done and like no, nothing's simple nothing's yeah. simple like, there's, there's always like a, a kind of underlying complexity to what you need to do it doesn't doesn't just come as something that you want to get up and go do so yeah it's, it's it's very complex hard to hard to describe in a, a few sentences i guess but there, there are a couple of the things that are like quite consistently just going on inside your head and it's because your brain isn't isn't as efficient at regulating the dopamine and it's like i said before when they call it a attention deficit we don't have a deficit in attention we've got a deficit in regulation so yeah we can focus really well and and adhd people they can actually hyper focus on stuff where they're really difficult to distract and they can just sit down and bang out weeks worth of work in the space of a few hours when your brain gets into that sort of mode of thinking and unfortunately it's usually triggered by like urgency so yeah. we'll 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 okay. really procrastinate because we're not able to get going with a task and then it's due last minute so essays at uni for me were a big one I'd be there like the night before doing them and then you, you bang out like a two one or even a first in some situations and it's like so much stress and like eight hours straight doing the work and you don't want to do it like you'd rather get the work done on time and it's mm -hmm. like you just can't get your brain to do it but yeah when 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 things are going well and you can focus in that way they, they can work really efficiently and get a lot more done than other people might um so the, the psychiatrist after my assessment he said that in in some ways when it's well managed it's almost an advantage over people that don't have it because you've got a very creative problem solving mind and you see things in a different way and when you can get into those work modes when you're when you're sort of leaning into that creativity and you're following the dopamine as such like you can you can do some really amazing things so it's it's very tough to live with and there is a lot of challenges that come with it but there, there is a lot of positives there as well when it's well managed and when you learn to work for your brain rather than trying to make your brain work for the society around you because modern living yeah. is not built for yeah. people that have got things like ADHD or autism but they can they can do some incredible things when we uh, let them work in the ways that they need to for sure yeah absolutely man absolutely and, and just on the back of that when you say you're unable to get into this like hyper focused state, mm. how do you manage to focus sort of day to day? Oh, it's it's tough to be fair. Like my my job now, we spoke about it a bit at the start. I work for like a, a triage team, so it's like quite snappy telephone assessments, just um, first point of contact, and then sorting a bit of a plan moving forward. So. I've got myself set up now where I only do like three hours in one go and then I've got a bit of a break and then another few hours. You need to take regular breaks. You need to make sure you're getting foods that promote dopamine. So yeah, okay. Yeah, there's there's different foods like eggs are a really big one, um, chicken, uh, oily fish, uh, blueberries and dark chocolate, funnily enough, like they're, they're, they kind of trigger producing more dopamine. So having things like that, that you include during the day and um, keeping active is a massive one, being outside. These are just things that 
it's almost like you've got a bit of a primitive brain and when you go back to those things and you get like natural dopamine it really helps to keep things more regulated um yeah i, I am looking a bit more into the um the sort of nutritional side of it as well i've, I've got a book that the psychiatrist recommended and that talks about like supplements and foods to include so i think zinc and magnesium are a couple of really big ones so if you can make sure you're including that in your diet or some form of supplement they're things that again it helps to regulate your brain a little bit more effectively and they, these are yeah. all things that help keep you focused but a, a big thing for me has just been sort of not forcing it uh, and I, I used to beat myself up and try force myself to kind of get get work done right there and then and try to do all the things and if if my brain isn't wanting to do things you can try as much as you want and then it just ends up leaving you feeling burnt out and you still haven't done the thing whereas yeah. if you if you take that pressure off and you're like right well there's no harm in leaving the dishes until tomorrow morning so then you don't pressure yourself to do it there and then and then because you end up feeling a bit better about reducing that to-do list and you kind of focus on something that's more just for your brain and getting things a bit more regulated you end up yeah. being able to do it a little bit later on and so yeah there's, there's there's a lot of ways that can help you manage it more effectively for sure and it's not not just the medications like some people do treat it more naturally um using things like supplements and dietary changes and a couple of those other techniques as well so there's there's, there's a lot of different ways there's definitely not like a a one-size-fits-all way to treat it uh, everyone's a little bit different and the meds they are effective for quite a lot of people but it's, it's definitely not the only way so there's there's a lot of different things you can include um you know you know like white noise machines that people listen to to like yeah. go to sleep yeah 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 there's, yeah, there's yeah. another one that's called brown noise and it's got more bass and um, so i've i found this absolutely mad so if i ever need to sit down and do like a boring repetitive task where i don't need to be talking to people if i chuck those in and start listening to some brown noise like that kind of almost um, gets you in that hyper focus mode where you can just latch on it's almost like it's just scratching your brain in the right way and it slows all that racing thought down and because it's giving you that sort of low level consistent input between the ears it like it lets you just think about what you need to do like I've, I've been trying to get going doing some copywriting recently and i just couldn't make myself sit down and do the work yeah yeah yeah. put yeah. the brown noise in i just sat down and banged out a full blog post like it was, oh, it was crazy so that, that 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 kind of triggered that sort of hyper focus i suppose when i got doing something that is important and i wanted to do but i couldn't get myself going and when when i had my brain with the uh the brown noise it just yeah it just sort of triggered it man i just got going with it with class yeah, that's mad. Do you think the same the same could work for like sleep as well then? Yeah, like if I don't have some kind of consistent noise when I'm trying to sleep, mate, like when when I first lay down, it'll take me hours to drop off. So I've always got like rain sounds or spa music yeah, like, okay, just playing yeah, next yeah. to me. Like it was nice in the heat wave having the fan just constantly going. Yeah. Having man. that consistent noise. Yeah. It's like it gives your brain something to focus on. And that means like, that yeah. you, you don't get overwhelmed with all the other stuff. So it lets you yeah. it lets you chill out a little bit more. So yeah, I think I think a lot of people with ADHD tend to need to do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I I actually knew a guy in Australia. Um, he couldn't sleep without putting a ten hour uh, video on YouTube. It was like a vacuum on loop. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? Like, like, I, I, like, I can get the whole like white noise stuff, okay? Like a yeah, yeah. noise, but vacuum man. Fucking Uber. <laughs> <laughs> Mental. Must but, be a similar uh, kind of thing though, just having that like consistent background noise. Yeah, look, whatever, whatever gets you off, man. If it works, man. <laughs> <laughs> whatever gets you off. But um, look, man, I think we've covered some really good ground here, man. Um, yeah, man. There's just one more thing that I wanted to ask you. Um, what would you say to someone who's listening right now who might have just been diagnosed with ADHD or maybe he's going through the process of being diagnosed? Mm. I think the main thing that i've tried to keep in mind is that you you're basically learning to human again at this point because you've spent your whole life thinking that you are the same as like 93 percent of people and you're going to go through a lot of a lot of different emotions during the next few months of this process so i think give yourself the time to process things at your own pace and start to start to try join the dots a little bit and make those connections and understand your behavior a little bit more in terms of adhd symptoms so don't sort of over medicalize yourself start to understand those behaviors and 
get the links between the way your brain works and the way that you act and the things that you do and approach it all with compassion and curiosity um you've, you've probably spent a lot of your life fighting these things and trying not to be the way you are and it's definitely time to start letting yourself just do what works for you and fi figuring out who you want to be uh, you, you're going to start unmasking a lot in the coming months and learning who you actually were before yeah. people started making you be what they yeah. thought you should be so it's going to be a very very rocky road but it does it does get easier as time goes by so just take take it at your own pace be kind to yourself and uh, stay curious nice man nice i like that mate i like that a lot tell us where we can find you so i did start off on instagram um it is still there if people want to message me and stuff. I don't really post much at the minute because the algorithm's been shafting me and I'm not paying to get my posts promoted. So uh, <laughs> happiness in movement on Instagram. Uh, I use TikTok pretty regular now. That's happiness in movement number one. Uh, and if anyone wants to email me about anything, I'm at info at happinessinmovement.co.uk. Sick, man. Nice. Can I ask what, what happiness in movement, like what's, where did that come from? So working as a physio, uh, obviously a, a big part of my job is all about like exercise and how important that is for staying healthy. And as I started struggling with my mental health and realized how important an active lifestyle was, I thought that I just wanted to start finding the, uh, the happiness in movement and the plan way back, which was one of my uh, sort of, uh, <laughs> not failures, I suppose, but I, I did at one point plan on starting like exercise groups for mental health and stuff like that. And that, that was kind of the uh, the original idea for it, to be fair. But uh, yeah, I think now I just try to promote sort of keeping active in ways that make you happy. I, I used to be a proper perfectionist with exercise and it ended up causing more trouble than anything because I just couldn't stick to a perfect routine because who can? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. exercise for me now, it's, it's, it's walks, it's breathing exercises, it's just random bits of stretching and movement throughout the day, little hit classes at home. So... Yeah, what whatever it is that gets you active, gets you feeling good, that's that's absolutely fine. That's it, man. That's it. I, I couldn't agree more, mate. Like I used to be obsessed six days a week just lifting mm. weights when I was younger. Yeah. And I might have looked good, but the only reason I was doing it was to look good. I wasn't happy lifting weights. Yeah, man. exactly. And now I'm just like, man, I'll go on a run, like I'll do yoga. Maybe mm. if I want to lift weights, like just whatever, man. It's just like Yeah, yeah. Keep <laughs> keep it interesting, man. Keep it mixed. That's it, man. That's it. But listen, I appreciate you coming on, mate. I think we've had a banging episode, man. And I'm sure... Yeah, it's been quality, mate. I've enjoyed yeah. it. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, man. No worries. I think the listeners are going to get a lot of value from you. If you enjoyed this episode, I promise you, you're going to enjoy all of the other episodes on the channel. You can find them by clicking here.